Welcome to the Therapy Show Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Mustard. In each episode, I interview a seasoned and knowledgeable talk therapist from the counseling world to glean valuable insights, techniques, and tools that you can apply to your practice and your life. And if you're considering a career in the counseling field or just want to hear about what it's like to be a talk therapist, then this is the podcast for you. Bill O'Hanlon is a psychotherapist and hypnotherapist, author, and speaker. He co-developed Solution-Oriented Therapy, has authored or co-authored over 39 books. He's also a musician who plays guitar and writes country music. And yes, he was also on Oprah with his book, Do One Thing Different. In this episode, Bill talks about meeting Dr. Milton Erickson for the first time and why a story about African violets completely shifted how Bill viewed problems, how he disrupted the psychotherapy field with his approach to talk therapy, how he got onto Oprah, and his love for writing country music. And please stay till the end because he sings us a song. I get a little teary at times throughout this interview. He doesn't mean to make me cry, but his passion and energy remind me why I decided to become a therapist in the first place, to live in the land of possibilities and solutions and help others do the same. I am so grateful for the time he gave me, and I really and truly enjoyed this chat, and I hope you do as well. Hey friend, want to be more comfortable while sitting on the therapy couch? I sure did and went looking for pants and tops that were soft, wrinkle resistant, and would match just about anything I already had in my closet. And now Zaya Active makes up about 80% of my wardrobe. Would you like to learn more? Head over to my site, lisamuster.com and click on the activewear tab. And don't think this is just for women. They have men's and kids clothes too. And our family is loving the quality and I am loving the price tags. So head over to my site to check it all out. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Therapy Show. I'm your host, Lisa Mustard. And y'all, I am so excited and thrilled to have today's guest on. You're probably going to know his name. His name is Bill O'Hanlon. Welcome to the show, Bill. It's so awesome to have you. Thank you. I'm impressed you have your Nashville song uh, uh, country hat on. Uh, That was was special just for me, right? (laughs) Well, I thought you would appreciate it. You know, I've I been do, listening. Okay, cool. It's funny. Your name, I know your name, right? I mean, going to grad school, marriage and family therapist, you're in my textbooks, you were in other, you know, just your name was brought up a lot. And you've studied with some incredible therapists and you yourself are a master therapist. And I know you're like, oh, stop, stop. But I got to give major shout out. It's rare that I get to talk to somebody who, I mean, you created a model, a framework that is used for over what 30 years now and across the world. So, wow. So thank you for being here. It's really special. I did. It is funny though, to me, you know, I used to travel around a lot. I don't do that quite as much anymore. I travel three or four times a month all around the world to speak and being a formerly shy person, that was a little strange for me, but I got used to it. And I would have people come up to me. Oh, I studied your stuff in graduate school 30 years ago. I'm like 30 years ago. <laughs> that carbon dates both of us. First of all, <laughs> it really carbon dates me because if you study my stuff, I must have written it before that. But I was just seized early on in my career by this big passion and mission to change the field of psychotherapy and make it less focused on what was wrong with people and a little more on their resources, their strengths and abilities. And that passion kind of pulled me out of my fear of speaking and shyness. I was an anxious guy when I was younger and my natural (laughs) laziness, I guess I would say, to write um, so far 39 books. um, I've never imagined I would do such a thing. So I had a mission because I love the field of psychotherapy, to tell you the truth. I was obsessed by it when I was younger. I just wanted to learn everything I could. Yeah, and I was influenced by Milton Erickson, who sort of moved me over to that side of thinking about people's abilities rather than their disabilities. And, you know, I love that when the so-called disability movement started calling themselves differently abled, I thought, Mm -hmm. ah, that's exactly like Milton Erickson taught me to think. It's like, well, what are your abilities? You have different abilities. What are they and how can we use those to move you forward? So that passion has driven me through a lot of stuff. And I had a mission to influence my field because I wanted it to change. Yeah. I really 
Well, I'm so glad you had that mission. I'm so glad you had those experiences. It really impacted upon me when I went to grad school and I was learning about all these different theories and about different ways to work with people. I remember being so drawn to the idea of solution focused or solution oriented. Like that just lit me up instead of pathologizing and putting a label and a diagnosis, which, you know, I understand we have to do at times. It's a solution for insurance and getting paid. Definitely. Right. <laughs> yeah. Definitely a solution for that. Yeah. And I, I want to just throw out there that my mentors and my supervisors were heavily influenced by Whitaker and Satir and Erickson. So my supervision was very strength focused, very strength based. And man, I can't help but see my clients or my patients through that light. And I really would like to learn more. And, you know, I did a little digging because I had to know more about you. And so I listened to a few episodes of you and other shows. And I want to just get your story out there about how you and Milton Erickson connected because it's amazing. And I find it really, I was laughing when I was listening to how you guys connected. So could you share that story for our listeners? Yeah, I was a hippie back in the day. So, you know, really long. I'm getting a little long again now during this uh, stay at home period, but getting my pandemic pompadour as we're. Uh, I like it. Speaking. Thanks. Look good. But I used to be a hippie and I had hair down to my waist and I was a very shy person, as I mentioned earlier. And I had to pay for my own college education. My parents weren't very wealthy and they went through a financial reversal. They'd helped the first year and then they couldn't help anymore. So I had to get a work study job and I got a work study job at the art gallery at the university I went to, which was Arizona State University, right outside of Phoenix. It's in Tempe. Arizona, a suburb of Phoenix. And um, one day this guy came in in a wheelchair being pushed around by uh, I what I assumed was his wife and his daughter, which was true, I found out later. And he came to the art gallery, actually, but we were on the third floor and it wasn't wheelchair accessible. This was back in the uh, Paleolithic age when they didn't have wheelchair accessibility everywhere. And so they came up, the, the wife and daughter came up and said, hey, is there a way we can get the wheelchair in here? And we didn't have any elevators. It was three flights of stairs. Hmm. And so I was the you know, worker there. I was on with just one other person who was my female fellow student. And so I said, well, we have a ramp that we bring, you know, if we have a dolly, we bring art pieces up through this ramp to this floor. So, you know, it's wide enough. Let's see if we can do it. And so that turned out to be Milton Erickson and Dr. Erickson who was a well-known psychiatrist, but I didn't know who he was, I, even though I was a, I majored in psychology. So I got him up that ramp. Uh, his wife and daughter were very skeptical that it could happen. And I got him up that ramp. And unfortunately, I hadn't thought through the return trip oh, because man. that ramp was like, I, it was like so steep. And here I was, I was, you know, 100 pounds, 110 pounds dripping wet, perhaps. He was kind of, by that point, a little big, and though it was one of those old metal wheelchairs, which was heavy. Mm -hmm. And so on the way down, I thought, okay, we're all going to die here. <laughs> we're both going to die because it was so heavy. But I step by step, I got him down. He was supremely confident in my abilities. I was not so confident. But um, after he left, one of my, the, my fellow student who was there said, do you know who that was? And I said, no. And she said, you're a psychology major. You should know that was a famous psychiatrist, Milton Erickson. I'm like, well, I never heard of him. And in one of those moments of kismet or fate, there happened to be an article about him in Newsweek magazine that, that week. And it was on the front desk of the art gallery. We, you know, there were boring times we would just read. And I read it and I was hooked. It spoke to me in some deep, soulful way, like what you know, the, the Jungians call numinous, like something is so attractive to you, you have to follow it. There's no rational you know, explanation, but I read everything I could of his. He hadn't really written any books, but I read articles. I searched all over into the library systems and did interlibrary loans to find out about him. And ultimately, it took me a few years because I was a I was a third year undergraduate student. It took me till I got into graduate school to become a psychotherapist, to work up the courage to write him. And he just lived in a house, and the, they had phone books in those days. You could just look him up in the phone book and call him up or write him a letter. There was no way I was going to call him, so I wrote him a letter, and he called me. And I became his gardener while I was in graduate school because again I had no money. I was working full time, 
And I studied with him and he sort of took me under his wings and changed my life. Wow. That's incredible. I love it. Just total fate that he walked in there and there you were. Yes. <laughs> Such a cool story. Such a cool story. You rolled in there. Yeah, he rolled in there, right? And you rolled him up and thankfully got him down safely. That's but how he rolled. Yeah, that's <laughs> how he rolled. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. Okay, so you go, you're a gardener. And how did you, how did like, what was the next step? How did he teach you hypnotherapy? Like what happened then? Well, I had worked as a gardener between undergrad and graduate schools again, because I needed a little money. I'd worked for a while. I'd, I'd sort of taken a break in school to earn some money to pay for graduate school. And so when I wrote him that letter, I said, you know, somebody ought to write your biography or write an article about you for Psychology Today or, you know, your life was really, he had a fascinating life, amazing life. He had polio, learned to walk when they said he would never learn to walk again. He got second thing in polio, they thought, but now we know it's post-polio syndrome. He learned to walk again. He walked a long walk in the Grand Canyon after the second time he relearned to walk. I mean, he's an amazing guy. Yeah. And so I said, somebody ought to write your story. And I could do gardening. For, I was just casting around for anything because I had no money to pay him. And he called me up and offered to see me in exchange for gardening. And uh, so I gardened for him. And he would just, you know, I'd roll him out to the garden. He would talk to me. And I, and I didn't know much about hypnosis at the time. But now I realize he was hypnotizing me. But I just thought he's just telling me these stories and he's talking in this really weird way. And I wanted to learn therapy from him, but maybe that's not going to happen. And I was too shy to say anything. And his wife, much to my eternal gratitude, came out and said, Milton, the boy wants to sit in on sessions. And she brought his calendar out and scheduled me to sit in on sessions. So gradually it worked from just gardening to sitting in on sessions. And I did both. I would come out and do gardening and then I would sit in on a session. So, or sometimes I would just do one or the other. So I studied with him for a while and he had, it's like being hit by a billiard ball. I mean, it just changed the course of my personal and especially my professional life and lit a fire under me. I was kind of, as I said, kind of a lazy hippie and not that focused. And I just got passionate so passionate that it took me beyond my what had been my limits of laziness and flakiness and disorganization and somewhat yeah. impulsivity and to focus enough to write 39 books and over 60 articles or book chapters and yeah. uh, travel around the world teaching workshops. Wow. Well, I definitely want to talk about your books and your writing and the coaching and all the stuff that you do. And of course, your your new venture. I'm so fascinated by this. But could you could you kind of go back a little bit and share how did solution-focused oriented therapy come about? I know that that's a pretty big piece of your legacy. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk oh, about it. <laughs> one day I was in, in a session with Dr. Erickson and he told a story that for me became the archetype for my work for many, many, many years and helped me really understand what was different about his work. I mean, he was a strange guy, let's just say that. He was eccentric and quirky and mm -hmm. like no one else I'd ever studied with or read about in psychotherapy. I mean, Carl Whitaker was like that too. It's yeah. like, what is Carl Whitaker up to? He does this weird stuff, but it seems to be effective. And and Erickson and Whitaker, to me, were a lot alike. They were so quirky, you could never exactly pin them down or figure out what they were doing. But there were some principles that Whitaker had and that Erickson had that sort of came clear to me when one day Dr. Erickson told me the story. It was about he had had this patient who was all messed up basically. And um, he changed the guy's life. It's a long story and it'll take too long to get into here. But uh, sometime after he'd helped that guy really change his life and, you know, not be so messed up. The guy called him and said, Dr. Erickson, I know you travel around and give workshops. I saw that you're going to Milwaukee and my favorite aunt lives in Milwaukee. And we're really close and we talk by phone she has become depressed in the last while. She's had an illness. She's been in a wheelchair. And at the time, Erickson walked with Kane, so he kind of knew what that was like to be sort of an outcast in society because you're, as I was saying earlier, quotation marks, disabled. And so this was in the 50s. So she, he said, I, w I wonder after your lecture in Milwaukee if you could go give her a visit because I'm really worried about her. I think she might be making plans to kill herself. 
So mm -hmm. Erickson went up there and turns out and he finishes the lecture, he goes to her house. She's been told to expect this great Dr. Erickson who her nephew just admires so much. And he knocks on the door and immediately they have a little bit of a bond because Erickson has his canes and she's in a wheelchair. It turns out that she's inherited a lot of, the, she's the oldest uh, child of that family and she inherited a lot of money. She never married. She, it's this like three story mansion that has like 13 rooms in it. She lives there alone. And when she got into a wheelchair a couple of years before, she converted the house to wheelchair accessibility with ramps and even elevators to go up and down. And so she's the most comfortable at home. She rarely goes out. And she's become socially isolated, personally isolated. She just lost her purpose in life. And so she shows Erickson around her house. And finally, she shows him the, the pride and joy of her life, which is she spent a lot of hours in her greenhouse, a plant nursery that's attached to the house. And Erickson notices on the shelf in that plant nursery, there's a bunch of little sprouts on the shelf in these pots. And he asks about them. And she points to a, an African violet plant that's on the um, potting table. And she said, oh, those are all cuttings from this one plant. I love African violet plants. And I'm making little cuttings. He said, well, that's really hard to get those sprouts going, isn't it? And she said, oh, yeah, it's really hard, but I have a green thumb. <laughs> and Erickson grew up on a farm. So they end up talking about that. She's also told them she used to be really active in her church community, but because it's so hard to get out and because she, there's no wheelchair accessibility in church, she's really withdrawn from most of her spiritual and social activities. So Erickson says, your nephew tells me you're depressed. And she said, yes, I have been rather depressed the last few years since my illness. And uh, he said, I don't think that's the problem. She looks kind of hopeful for a second. He said, she said, you don't? He said, no, I think the problem is you haven't been a very good Christian. And this really gets a reaction from her because she comes from this very moralistic, judgmental family. But he quickly explains, he says, look, you have this great gift from God of being able to grow plants. And you have this amazing church community that you told me you used to really be involved in and active in. You have all this money, all this time. What I recommend is you get those African violet plants, you're making new plants, repot them into gift plants, hire somebody to drive you to somebody in your church's community that has been going through a good time or a hard time, graduation and an engagement, a marriage, you know, a birth, a death, an illness, some tragedy, and bring your Christian presence in that African violet plant so they remember you were there and they can watch something grow rather than die. And so she agrees, maybe she's been too self-absorbed, he goes away many years. That was in the 50s. Many years later, 1977, I'm studying with Dr. Erickson. He sends me to his bookshelf, pulls out, has me pull out a scrapbook. And there's this article from the Milwaukee Sentinel Journal from 1968 or whatever it was. And it said, the headline said, African Violet Queen in Milwaukee dies mourned by thousands. Mm -hmm. They couldn't fit the people into the church that wanted to come to memorial service because everyone loved her and she'd always shown up for them. Yeah, I mean, really, it just touched me so much and I was like so after that we were in Erickson's office we go out to the garden because I'm working for him and he's in his wheelchair and I'm there digging in the garden and I just I just said Dr. Erickson that story just touched me so much and here I am in graduate school and what they're teaching me is if somebody's depressed send them to the psychiatrist for medication mm -hmm. if they're depressed find out about their family history of depression if they're depressed, ask them all about their symptoms and what, how difficult it is for them. You had a totally different approach to that woman. I want to learn the African violet way of doing therapy. And how do I do that? And he said, well, he looked at the ground as he was wanting to do. And he said, I looked all around her life and everything looked depressing, except those African violets and except for her passion for her religion. And he said, I thought it'd be easier to grow the African violet parts of her life than to weed out the depression. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was the beginning of a new path. And I thought, okay, how do I look for the African violet parts of my clients and my patients' lives? And, you know, I kept waiting for that person to come in who was in a wheelchair, who was <laughs> depressed and who grew African violets. Of course, that never happened. 
but I had to kind of get the bigger principle and the bigger principle ultimately with not just me because there were several of my colleagues, including Steve DeShazer with whom I corresponded in those years. We both were fascinated with Erickson. He'd never met Erickson, but he read everything of Erickson's and he'd written the most articles. And we both started to kind of carve out this new approach to psychotherapy, influenced a lot by interactive ideas, the MRI, brief therapy people, and Dr. Erickson's work that ultimately Steve DeShazer and Insu Berg called Solution Focused and I called Solution Oriented. And it was really about searching for the African violet parts of people's lives. Not being Pollyanna, not just saying, oh, think positively. Okay. The distinction I got after a while was Erickson wasn't doing therapy from the outside in. He was more like Carl Rogers. He was trying to evoke stuff rather than adding things from the outside, instruction or correction or diagnosis. Mm -hmm. He, like Rogers, believed that people had goodness and answers within, and he was trying to evoke those, the things that were already there. So it could be briefer therapy because of that, because you didn't have to add anything from the outside or teach people or instruct people or restructure their cognitions like Albert Ellis and cognitive therapists do. He believed people had the answers within, and all you had to do was arrange the environment to evoke those abilities and then channel them in the right direction. For me, that was a life-changing, therapy direction-changing thing to realize because like with Carl Whitaker, you and I talked just before we started talking, Whitaker had this idea that if you just, first of all, were so authentic, second of all, disrupted whatever the people were doing, something else would emerge. And so he had a different approach to it. Uh, more of a disruptive approach. And Erickson had that occasionally, but more, I think Erickson, Carl Whitaker, and Carl Rogers had this trust in people's basic health and goodness if you could remove whatever was getting in the way for them expressing that, and you could help them channel it a bit. And so to me, that was a revolution in psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that you can't do diagnosis. Occasionally, Erickson did diagnosis. Occasionally, I do. And occasionally, diagnosis is empowering for people. But the main focus is in what are they capable of doing and how can you channel that to solve the problems that brought them in? Yes. Amen. Oh, I'm crying over here of your story and just your energy and your passion for this work. And, you know, wow, I just... I think about my past my past 10 years of the work that I've been doing. And unfortunately, I don't get a lot of space for doing that kind of psychotherapy anymore. And so I've been thinking, oh, maybe I want to get back into private practice. And gosh, you're inspiring me. Like you are just like re-energizing re me for this world of psychotherapy. So thank you uh, selfishly for, for sharing all that. And I know, I know our listeners are just like getting so much out of this. So one of the things that my, I don't even know, maybe you know my, do you know anybody in South Carolina who's a therapist? I know. I, yeah, I've traveled around so much. <laughs> tell, me, tell me their name. Do you know Dr. Russell Haber? Is that name? Oh, yeah. about? No, oh you know Russ. Russ. Sure, sure. I'm sorry. Again, that carbon days is, I met yeah. Russ probably in the 80s, maybe early 90s. I don't know. It's been a while. Yeah. Well, he, he was my supervisor and my mentor. So what oh, yeah. a small world. That's just so cool. You know, so much yeah. of what you're saying reminds me of being in supervision with him and you know, just sitting there going, what are you doing? Like, Russ, oh my gosh, what's going on? But, you know, I think for when I was a new therapist, it scared me because I didn't trust myself. I didn't feel confident in my ability to sit with people. And I wanted to do things by the book and I wanted to get it right. And, and so can you help the therapists that are listening right now that are new? What would you say to them to have more confidence in themselves to, you know, step outside a little bit and maybe do this work, strength-based, strength-focused, helping people look for the solutions in their lives versus pathology. I don't want to say, but diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. diagnosis and pathologizing. Yeah. yeah, we needed all those big words. But I think, you know, it is good to learn a lot of psychotherapies. But the difficulty is, it's like you're in the room and you're going, oh, should I use the cognitive thing here now? Should I use attachment theory? You're thinking too much. And, you know, I love the stuff that's been done. I think Scott Miller really touts it a lot, but a bunch of other people have been doing it about being in the room connected to people, that your connection with people and their trust of you and your trust of them, that relationship, the alliance, they call it in some of the research, is so important. 
And another big important from the research that we know about what makes psychotherapy work is your belief in people. And Erickson had <laughs> unshakable. I never met anybody who thought everybody could change. Yeah. Yeah, I, he just believed everybody could change. And I'm like, well, some people maybe not, but he was, no, he was unshakable that people could change. And I was like, wow, I mean, that is, I'm kind of psychotically optimistic these days. I really think best, the good things could happen. Mm -hmm. But he was really, he just had that in his bones that there were, you just had to find the right way in with people. So that's first thing, have trust in yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, there was some reason you were pulled to this profession, that you wanted to help people. Trust that, that your heart is generally in the right place. Most people's hearts are in the right place. Second of all, trust what's in your client. The third thing is trust the relationship. Like I tell people, when you go out to lunch with your friend, you don't think, well, what strategy should I use in the conversation right now? Right. What's the best? You're just there with them reacting and responding and telling stories and being who you are. And there are some people that really like you because of that, some people that don't. I mean, you just connect with some people. So trust that. It's the it's it's in you, it's in them, and it's in the relationship between the, the two of you or the three of you or five of you if you're doing couples or family or group therapies. Trust that stuff. I'd say, you know, there was years ago, Karkov and Truex, who were some of um, Rogers, Carl Rogers' students, did some research on what was effective in therapy, and they found people had natural therapeutic skills, warmth, genuineness, empathy, connection, and all that kind of stuff. And they studied a group of people who were just lay people, and then a group of people who were lay people who were just about to start a PhD program in clinical psychology. And they studied their natural therapeutic abilities f over the course of about 10 years. And they found that when people went to clinical psychology school, their natural abilities went down while they were in graduate school. And it took a few years after graduate school for them to come up to the normal levels that they had beforehand, which is probably what, you know, what pulled them to become a therapist because right. they wanted to help people and they had some sort of ability to listen, connect, be genuine, be authentic, be warm. And then they learned all these theories and they sort of got in the way. So I'd say it's probably a journey that we all have to go through. Do we get sort of worried about using the right thing? But the right thing is you, you're your instrument in therapy. Yeah. You know, it's like a surgeon keeping their tools clean. Your job is to keep yourself clear and kind and connected and listening and being there for people. And then the technique goes on top of that. The technique, I, you know, there's some research technique doesn't matter. So I think it matters. I think your theory matters. I think technique matters. But at base, it's your humanity that you're bringing to that moment. And the non judge you know, Carl Rogers, the non-judgmental, you know, about who they are. You can be judgmental about what they do. It's not okay to kill people. That you can have a judgment about that. That's actions, but about who they are. That's what I got from Carl Rogers and Carl Whitaker and Milton Erickson. They were all so deeply accepting of people and connected with people in fast. All of them could do it really fast. Yeah. That's really cool. I love, I think that's when you were talking about the story of the African violets, you know, I was listening to the story and I was like, well, what, how did he get there so quickly? And so I was trying to break it down and, you know, I wrote down, he understood her experience and he can, he connected with her so quickly that they had those, like he had that within him when he walked in there. So if it had been a different person with different disabilities or something, it wouldn't have happened so quickly possibly. So I'm always trying to understand like what just happened that 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 connection was just so fast. And, but I also believe, like you said, he probably could connect. And I find this to be the case with like, with Russ, you know, like I would watch him in session and, and I imagine with you too, like you just know what you're doing because you're looking for connection. You're looking for shared experiences and you're looking for um, a warm way in to build that alliance as quickly as you can. Hey guys, I want to tell you about a group I've created on Facebook. It's called the Talk Therapist Lounge, and it's a place where we talk therapists can find podcast guest opportunities. That's right. If you're a licensed talk therapist and you are looking to grow your reach and visibility, this group may be a place for you to start. I'm working to bring in podcast hosts who are wanting to interview licensed clinicians 
that can share their expertise and knowledge with their audiences. Why should you be a guest? That's a really good question. Let me tell you, people are crawling all over the internet, listening to podcasts and watching videos on mental health issues. My mission is to help spread the word about mental health treatment and help lower the stigma around mental health. And to do that, we need to get you guys out there sharing your knowledge, sharing your wisdom and how you help people live their best lives. And it may help grow your brand and visibility and possibly help you gain new clients. I also share how to create a podcast guest one sheet and tips and ideas for getting yourself booked on shows. So will you come join us? Look for the Talk Therapist Lounge on Facebook. I hope to see you there. There's the name of the book, A Warm Way In. I think you should write that book. (laughs) Speaking of writing books, all right, let's just transition. Yes. All right. um, okay, because we could, I mean, I could talk to you for hours. I'm like fascinated. First of all, you were on Oprah, correct? I was. That okay. was my big claim to fame. You know, before I was on Oprah, I used to do mm. workshops and people would say, Ah, oh, Bill O'Han's written 17 books and he's this and that and he's studied with Mel Erickson, you know, and people, yeah, you know, and they'd pull it. I swear to you, after I was on Oprah, people would introduce me because I'd put that in my bio. And Bill O'Hanlon was on his on Oprah with his book, Do One Thing Different. I, people would just sit up in a oh, different way yeah. of attention. It's like, okay, that never goes away. That's my claim to fame yeah. forever. But I think you got it. Cool. I think it's awesome because it definitely makes you go, well, Oprah, how did that happen? No, not everybody gets to go on Oprah. It's so, true. so that book, how did that happen? Did she find you? Did she read it? Was she. Like, how well, I'll happen? tell you a little story. Yeah, I, let's you know, go. I like stories. You know, I like stories. But um, I like them too. <laughs> I, I written this book. I, I had written a bunch of books for psychotherapists. And I was not a natural writer. I mean, first book, three years, blood on the keyboard. I hated every minute of it. And there's an old Dorothy Parker joke. She said, I don't like to write. I like to have written. And that is was absolutely true for me for about my first 17 books. But I got better at it. And... I really had, I wanted to get these ideas out to everyone, not just psychotherapists. I thought, well, if I get to psychotherapists, then they'll get them to other people. But I'd like to get these ideas because they're pretty accessible ideas, these solution-oriented ideas, uh, strength-based ideas to the general public. So I decided to write a book about that. And just around that time, my editor, I a lot of my books were published by W.W. Norton. My editor at Norton said, you know, I had this guy call me and he said, which of you, my wife's a psychotherapist and I'm looking for psychotherapists who can write self-help books for the general public. Do you have anybody in your list of authors that's good? And she goes, Bill O'Hanlon. She just said that the first thing because I have this enthusiasm, as you heard, and I had that ambition. She knew I had that. So he called me up, this guy named Jim Levine. He was a literary agent in New York and he, he and I talked and we got my first book. I moved to a second literary agent for that second book and uh, Harper Collins picked it was uh, Harper Collins big big publisher picked it up and gave me a pretty good advance. I was like, wow, you can make money writing books. That's cool. And I said, well, I said to the publicist, I get on Oprah. This is the book. And she said, ah, Bill, Bill, Bill. The people, you know, everybody wants to get on Oprah, but you, you, it just doesn't happen. You know, it's so rare. And I said, no, no, I will do whatever I need to do because I think that this needs to be on Oprah and get out in the world. Yeah, you know, I wrote the book go out big. The book wasn't out yet. It was going to come out in a few months. And she goes, yeah, yeah. We've had authors like you who are enthusiastic, willing to work. Oprah staff has said, if you bug us or if you don't call off your author, we'll never have one of your books on our show again. So please don't do that. And so I'm like, well, what are you going to do? She goes, we're going to send them a book and a one-page description of it. Oh, that's it? They must get thousands of them. She goes, yeah, they do. So I kept pushing. And finally she said, okay, Bill, I'll give you a number to call to get on Oprah. I'm like, oh, okay, what? She goes, 1 800 prayer line. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, so I was like, okay, so I hang up. But I swear, a month later, she called me up, that publicist from HarperCollins, and said, one of Oprah's producers called me about your book. She's leaving for home in 15 minutes. She, call her now. I'm hanging up. Here's the number. Boom. I called her. They had me on. It came out the day my book came out, the Oprah show. And it's, sold a bunch it was amazing they did the whole show on the idea behind the book which is make a small change to make a big change easier to make a small change than a dramatic change keep experimenting with small changes till you find the one that really jumps you off the groove and changes your life so 
Ed, Ed sold 60000 out of the gate, which was a good thing. I love that. And it got out there, and it just came out. Actually, it, we're, we're on video, but people can hear uh, – People can just hear the audio, but they're going to have to imagine the book because I'm showing it to you because we're Ooh. seeing each other on camera. Do One Thing Different just came out with a 20th anniversary edition. Do One Thing Different, 10 Simple Ways to Change Your Life. Oh, I must get that. That's awesome. Yes. Book. 20 years. That's incredible. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about your books. And so the first 17, you said were horrible, not horrible, but they were hard to write. Like, hard. It hard. was hard well, to write. It was just the first one was three years and torture. Okay. And I co-wrote it with a guy in England and we fought about everything and it was terrible. The next one, I had taught a workshop about 50 times on Erickson's work. And it was called Taproots, published by Norton. And it only took nine months to write. Still blood on the keyboards, but not quite as bad because it's only nine months and rather than three years of blood on a keyboard. Each one after that was about a year till I hit my 17th book and I wrote a book in a week. Whoa. I had an unexpected week off. Some workshop had canceled and I just got up one day and I had a book and it just came pouring out of me. Never had it happen before. It was always torture and always I'd rather be doing something else than write. And so this one came out and I think I just found my groove. You know, I found that flow place mm -hmm. and most of the books I've written since then have been two or three weeks a month two months part-time. So it's not so torturous. And when I get an, and the other thing that encouraged me was I knew I could get a book published before. I didn't even know how the process went. Like, how do you yeah. navigate the whole maze and how do you get an agent? And if you're going to go for a general public book, a lot of my books were psychotherapy books. So I didn't need an agent, but how do you do that? And so I learned all that. Ultimately, it just got a lot easier. I've just finished my 39th book and I'm working on a 40th one. The last few are on my new career, which maybe we'll talk about, about songwriting. But most of them were self-help books or about psychotherapy. And then, of course, people would come up to me when they'd meet me and say, I want to write a book. And so I wrote two books on how to write books, one for therapists, one for the general public. One that for general public was called Writers of Herb. It's out of print now. But the other one is called... I don't know how to publish a book for a psychotherapist or I can't remember what it's called, but it's about that. It's Norton. I can't remember the names of all my books. Yeah. And in fact, I have 17, they're translated in 17 languages. And sometimes people say, Hey, is your book in Spanish? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I, I can't keep track of this stuff. That's, that's when you know you've written too many books, when you can't remember the names of your books and uh, you can't remember what, what they're translated in, but they've been translated in 17 languages and, Sold a lot of books. Some, you know, some have sold a couple of thousand. Some have sold thirty or forty thousand, sixty thousand. You know, yeah. whatever. It's it's different for each one. I'm trying not to write any more books. I try to restrain myself. I know other people try and get themselves to write books. I try and I tell myself, stop me before I write another book. I I want to do other things. Yeah, that's so exciting. What's your favorite book that you've written? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it changes. It's like your kids, I guess, you know, when they always ask you that. But uh, the best, the favorite book was the one that came out in a week. It was called A Lazy Man's Guide to Success. I give it away now because my agent said, it's too short. I can't get it published. I said, well, what about like who moved the cheese that was short? And she said, yeah, that was by a best-selling author. You're not a best-selling <laughs> author, Bill. So I can't get that one published. So I just started giving give it away because I wanted it out to everybody in the world. A Lazy Man's Guide to Success. If you go on my website, BillOhanlon.com, you get a free downloadable copy of it. And it was a fun book to write. I, yeah. I just loved writing that. I started to read it when um, I reached out to you initially. I, I got it and I downloaded it. So I definitely plan to read that. So do you coach people individually or not so much anymore? I used to. Um, it's not much individually. Occasionally I would. I mean, <laughs> I've coached. That's how I started coaching people because a friend of mine had a really great idea. And I used to consult with him. And he used to consult with me on stuck cases. He lived in New York City. And I, he told me something one day and I'm like, you got to write a book on that. He goes, what? he looked at me like I had two heads, like, right. I wouldn't know the first thing about writing. Well, I know the last thing about writing a book. So I'll tell you all I know. <laughs> and he got a uh, $30,000 advance. I'm like, whoa, he'd never written a word. He got, you know, and like he, you know, one of his translations earned 21,000 after that. And I was like, wow, that's great. So I started coaching people and I created an online course yep. and I coached over 300 books. It's still every, every couple of weeks, somebody writes me, Hey, I took your course two years ago and now I'm getting a book published. So 
I did that for a while, but I'm on to something else. Which yes. You know. Well, I, okay. So real quick, before we go on to the next thing, yeah. I went to your website and the solution oriented training that is available for mental health clinicians. Is that out there now? Like it's 14 hours mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. 14.5 CE credits. I don't, the answer to that is I don't know. I stopped, I did online courses Mm -hmm. and I did them so much. I didn't have to work anymore, (laughs) which was a good thing. You know, I was poor hippie my my whole (laughs) life and terrible with money. And all of a sudden I had enough and that was cool Mm -hmm. to be to a place where I didn't have to work for money anymore. Uh, That led me to my next endeavor, which we'll talk about, but that course is, I think, available, but we did a launch, which was a week-long registration. I think you can still get it, but I don't know. Okay. I'll tell you the truth. I think it's Psych Maven is the is the sponsoring agency. I used to do my own courses, and then I retired from that. And then somebody just approached me, one of my old workshop sponsors, and said, hey, I've just moved online. You want to do a course for me? I go, no, I don't really want to do a course because I'm busy with something else, but I have three courses just sitting here. And okay. so he said, well, can I have them and we'll sell them together and just split the profits? Sure. Okay. So he's got it. Maybe it's available now, but we just launched it a couple of weeks ago and then it went off the market. But I think if you found it, you could buy it. Okay. So if, if folks want to kind of learn from you, this is an opportunity. Like this yeah, would this be where they should go. Solution oriented approach and it's psych maven on teachable.com. So okay. I don't know. Okay. We'll check maven. it out. Uh, teachable.com. And then I have another one coming out on uh, Ericksonian hypnosis probably in the next while. And then he and I combined to do one on how to become a professional speaker and how to create your own professional CE uh, events, CE, because he knows how to get those CEs and do online and offline things. He did that for a while. So we're combining on that. And maybe someday I'll revive my book writing course, which is a great course again, but I just, um, I'm on to something. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about it. So tell us what you do nowadays. This is so cool. I just, and I hope you'll play us something before we go. I would well, love it. Uh, I have a guitar back here. I suppose I could do it. But yeah, I, you know, again, hippie back in the day and I never had any money and I didn't want and didn't know anything about money. And of course, I spent all my time thinking about money because I never dealt with it. And so through the years, as I made more money, I still had those bad money habits. And, you know, I had four kids and they all had to go to college and, you know, stuff like that. So I just was always overspending or in debt beyond my capabilities. And then I found a way to do online courses. I was traveling around a lot, making a lot of money, but traveling around and I was gone all the time. And so I decided I want to be home. I live in a beautiful place in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I was almost never here. I was traveling three or four times a month. I'd go to China and go to Japan, Australia, all over the States and South America and Asia and Europe and, you know, all sorts of places. And so I thought, I love this work. I just want to be gone so much and so busy. So I did it. And as I said, I sort of mastered the money part of life. And I thought, you know, as an old hippie, I thought, well, the whole world runs on this money thing. I better figure out the money game and work it out. And so it doesn't run the show anymore. When I did that, I was like, wow, I've gone way past my dreams. I've written all these books. I've taught all these workshops. I've had an influence on my field, which was my big mission. And I've helped a bunch of other people write books to change the world. And, you know, like, what now? And I, there were a couple of unrealized dreams. And one of the biggest ones was when I was younger, I had a choice to be a therapist or to be a songwriter and singer songwriter. And I thought, you know, that's kind of selfish, the music thing. So I should go help people. Well, of course, not really thinking music has saved my life at times. It's such a powerful and important thing for me. So I was like, well, now that I've already done my service to the world, even if I think it's a selfish thing, I want to be a songwriter. And I I don't want to be a singer songwriter anymore because I don't want to travel around. But I want to write songs that get hurt by millions of people and touch millions of people in their hearts. So I thought, well, you know, here's the thing about all that I've done. I've learned how to learn. I mean, when you go to graduate school, you sort of learn how to learn. When I became a therapist, I learned how to learn. When I became a writer, I learned how to learn to write and to get published. And when I became a speaker, I learned that. When I learned online stuff, and I thought, well, I know how to learn. So, you know, I already sort of intuitively know how to write songs, but I'd like to really up my game and get write commercially and have people record my songs. So I started going, I just Googled songwriting workshops and uh, I started going to them. I found some mentors like you found, you know, Russ and other people 
And I found Milton Erickson. I found the Milton Erickson's of songwriting, and they taught me, and I had enough money to pay them and to, you know, get instruction from them, get mentoring from them. And I have learned to write songs, and I'm writing like I wrote books, but even more intensively. Last year, I wrote 163 songs. This year, uh, so far, I've written 103. I'm writing one right after we talk. It'll be 104 if we finish one. In Nashville, they just get, they treat songwriting like a job. They get together in the morning, they write a song in three hours, take a break for lunch, and they write a song later. And I'm like, how do you do that? Well, I've learned how to do it. And part of the trick is co-writing, where you're editing each other and everybody brings their own strengths. Some people bring melody strengths, some people bring lyric strengths, some people bring ideas, some people are good editors. And so I've learned how to write a song and my first four songs are out uh, by independent artists. I had my first song on television. It was on an MTV show called Bush Family Brood. And um, I'm having the greatest time of my life. And it, you know, one of the things I learned when I was going along about how do you keep your brain alive as you age? You know, and I'm up there, I'm in my late sixties and I just figured out you learn new things all through life. I mean, you keep fit, and, you know, eat right and stuff like that, but you learn new things and keep your brain alive. And learning songwriting has been like being in graduate school the last three or four years. And now I feel I'm in my internship or residency after graduate school. So it's a lot of fun. So it's cool you yeah. have your uh, Nashville cowgirl hat. <laughs> Just for you. All right. Well, golly, I mean, I'm just blown away. I think that's the neatest thing, the neatest transition. And I just, uh, I'm, I'm so happy for you. You know, I'm just so happy that you have been able to accomplish all of this and make such an impact. And, you know, you've definitely, definitely impacted so many therapists out there. And would you, I mean, can you? Do you have a minute to play us a song or something? I would love to see you in action or hear you in action. I probably can. Okay, great. You see, uh, if you were on the video, you would see I have like 14 guitars. Yeah, <laughs> at I least. A, band, a band guitar, a bunch of guitars. I have a mandolin. Crazy. <laughs> All right, so let me play a song. You know, one of the kinds of, th I, I created a couple kinds of therapy, solution oriented. And a thing called um, inclusive therapy. One of the things that Erickson was so good at is kind of giving people permission to be who they were, to be selfish and generous at the same time. And that influenced me. He'd say, you can pay attention to what I'm saying and you can ignore what I'm saying. And I thought, wow, that's sort of like, you know, Eastern religions, the yin and the yang thing. So that influenced me a lot. And when I went to Nashville, one of the first hit songwriters I met was a guy named Gary Burr, who'd had 14 number ones. And I met Gary and his wife, Georgia Middleman, who's also a hit songwriter. And Georgia is really interested in therapy. So I was doing a therapy workshop in Nashville. She came along and afterwards she said, I heard you say something that would be a great idea for a song, Bill. I go, really? She goes, yeah, let's Gary and you and me write that song. Now, I'm, you know, at the beginning level, and here I am writing with two hit songwriters, like, okay, twist my arm, I'll do it. <laughs> and we wrote this really fun song. And the only problem with it is, you know, country music, they try and keep it really simple and conversational. And there's one word in this song that's keeping this song from getting cut by other people. Otherwise, I love the song. And it's called Contradiction. So um, here it is. You'll find, you'll hear the word when it goes by. It's definitely not a country music word. So. <laughs> I'm going crazy or if I'm all right maybe it's a little of both I'm glad you're gone I wish I had you back how come my train of thought keeps running on two tracks you never even crossed my mind I think about you all the time I'm moving on I'm never getting over you I'm all messed up and I'm okay I miss you every other day It's funny how two opposites can both be true So I give myself permission To embrace the contradiction of love I 
A broken heart has battling emotions when it's pulled apart. It just makes room for more. I'm just fine, and I'm just falling to pieces. So I'm learning how to be. Wait for it, here it comes. <laughs> One great big dichotomy. You never even cross my mind. I think about you all the time. I'm moving on. I'm never getting over you. I'm all messed up and I'm okay. I miss you every other day. It's funny how two opposites can both be true. So I give myself permission to embrace the contradiction. I've learned since we lost each other when it comes to love it's one thing and another you never even cross my mind I think about you all the time I'm moving on I'm never getting over you I'm all messed up and I'm okay I miss you every other day it's funny how Opposites can both be true. So I give myself permission. You know, the truth is stranger than fiction. So I give myself permission to embrace the contradiction. I love yeah. it. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, that was fabulous. You have, gosh, you're talented. No Thanks. one's picked. Nobody wants to play that. Like nobody wants to because of that one word. That one word. It's really oh. stopping it. It's too bad. It's a fun song. It is fun and it's beautiful and I love it and I love how you, you know, you just combine all your passions all in that song. It's very very cool and I am so grateful that you are here. Thank you so much Thank you for having me for an interest in chatting. Uh, it's good to get to connect with you and it's good to have this conversation. Yeah, I just want you to know, Bill, that like. I, I go in and out of this work with burnout and overwhelm. And I mean, just connecting with you and talking with you and hearing your story. I mean, it truly re-energizes me and has me realize like, Lisa, do some more self-work and get back out there because I do, I do. I want to help people and I want to help them live their best lives. And, you know, I was also thinking that one of the things that Russ used to have us do is he would always say, the problem isn't the problem. The problem is, and he would like, let us fill in the blank and it's the solution. That's it's great. the solution. So thank you again. I mean, would you, would you, do you think about that? Like the problem isn't the problem. The problem is, you know, some would oh, say yeah. the thinking or the system or, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, things yeah, like that. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Well, you say hi to Russ when you connect with him again. I will for sure. Okay. Well, thank you again, Bill. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Lisa. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Therapy Show with Lisa Mustard. I know there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I'm thankful you've chosen to listen to mine. Be sure to visit lisamustard.com to access the show notes and discover more fantastic content. And I'd be grateful if you subscribe to the show. Thank you.